Well, SIBO practitioners, I said we, I would find Dr. Steven Sandberg Lewis, who's coming out to Australia to teach us the gastrointestinal practicum in November. And we've already have a full on podcast about the wonderful things that Dr. S uh, Steven Sandberg Lewis, or SSL as we call him, will teach us in November, but I thought I'd catch up with him because he's actually an expert in PPI use and um, H. pylori. So I was gonna ask him about sort of a tricky topic of what are some health aspects of H. pylori. So that's gonna be very interesting. Yeah, so there's been research since the 1980s as soon as they knew about H. pylori as an organism, uh, a lot of doctors were researching the disease-causing effects, you know, the, the standard diseases which would be duodenal ulcers, peptic ulcers, gastritis, um, maltoma, uh, type of lymphoma of the stomach, and uh, gastric cancer. But there were researchers at the same time that said, wait a minute, this can't be all bad. So I actually have some lectures that I call the only good H. pylori is a dead H. pylori, right? <laughs> the answer is no. Um, a lot of times when I find H. pylori in patients that I'm doing these screening tests that we do, you know, you find the stool antigen or the stool antibody IgG, if my patient doesn't have ulcer type symptoms, if my patient doesn't have, I, you know, if I'm aware that they don't have maltoma in their stomach, they've had a scope, uh, I give them the high five, you know, mm. high five, you have H. pylori. <laughs> and the reason being, I, I think it, there's a real problem when you do those screening tests and you're screening all these people that don't necessarily have mm -hmm. peptic ulcer symptoms and you find out they have H. pylori and then you kill it. Anyway, I don't care whether it's herbal mm -hmm. or prescription, it's not necessarily the right thing. We know there's really good evidence that H. pylori, first of all, is one of the essential ancestral dominion organisms mm -hmm. of the gastric microbiota, the stomach microbiota, and that young children get it from siblings, from parents, even from polluted water. So, you know, people, 100% of the world's population used to have it. Now, there are altered forms that in older people can cause some of these diseases that we're concerned about. But uh, once, once a child has those, their risk of hay fever, asthma, other types of allergies, eczema, all go way down. The risk of Crohn's disease goes way down. It's basically the, the, one of the most important immune uh, developing organisms that is supposed to be there. I mean, think of it along with Bifidobacter and Lactobacillus wow. you know, in, the, in the larger yeah. guts. But uh, another piece I think that's really important is it protects, it is very protective. Many, many studies and have looked at this. Protective against reflux, and its complications, including Barrett's esophagus. Oh my goodness, yeah. And esophageal cancer. So esophageal cancer levels have greatly increased over the last 30 years as we've been killing more and more H. pylori since we've known about it and we've used these triple therapies that you know, are very, uh, at least until recently, now we have antibiotic resistance mm. with clarithromycin, but they've been very effective at eradicating it. So now, in the United States, I don't know about Australia yet, I haven't looked into it, but in the United States, only about 7% of children have it. it. Used to be 100%, and only about 10% of adults. Mm -hmm. So they don't have it to pass on to their newborns so that the risk of all of these allergic conditions yeah. and autoimmune conditions like Crohn's, mm -hmm. they're going up and up and up and up. Mm. Um, in, in countries like Asia, areas like Asia where we definitely have very high rates of H. pylori, reflux and esophageal cancer were very low. Stomach cancer was higher. Mm. And now it's flipping as more and more people get their H. pylori destroyed. Mm. So 
I think you really have to think about it, not just the only good H. pylori is a dead H. pylori. You know, there's a lot of interesting, so many interesting points you made, and uh, some of it, if you haven't read it, Martin Blazer's The Missing Microbes, where he really also goes into the benefits of, of H. pylori, but certainly not to the level that you just said. But um, I was going to ask you about Barrett's esophagus because so many people are on P PPIs uh, to prevent Barrett's esophagus and I heard that there's also some controversy around that and I actually talked to Lenny Weinstock about uh, that much of it is actually not due to um, it's mostly acid reflux but a lot of people have alkaline reflux right so if you want to just briefly mention something about that but just to, uh, Dr. SSL has just said he'll be on the podcast talking about PPIs so that's awesome yeah, uh, but in terms of what you're talking about, mm. preventing Barrett's, or even more so, uh, treating Barrett's to try to prevent more uh, advanced dysplasia and moving towards cancer of the esophagus. The largest study that's been done to date was in Denmark. It was published a couple of years ago. Almost 10,000 people with Barrett's esophagus, and they found that the more assiduously they took their proton pump inhibitors, the higher their risk oh of getting severe dysplasia or esophageal cancer was. And you know, it's possible there were some flaws in that, but they followed people for almost 15 years. All these other studies, three years, mm. maybe. Wow. So uh, there's there's just as much evidence that they increase the risk of cancer as protect in Barrett's and that's why the new guidelines from the American College of Gastroenterology about using proton pump inhibitors in Barrett's says the only for sure time that you should give proton pump inhibitors is if the Barrett's patient has symptoms and mm. the proton pump inhibitors take away their symptoms. Right. They don't say you should just use them as a prophylaxis. Right. That makes a lot of sense. Well, thank you so much for joining us here at, uh, what, what do they call it now, SIBOCon 2018. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, look forward to the podcast on PPI use with Dr. SSL. Thank you so much. Sure.